You know, when I hear the word history, I always think it's actually high story because that's what history is. It's the stories that come together from all of us, uh, the most insignificant to the most famous. And so what I'm going to do now is tell you the story of the Chicago Spoon, the spoon that my grandmother, Mary Paris O'Hines, brought from the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition back to her home in Minnesota. Now you should know a few things about my grandmother. She was born over 140 years ago on the prairie in Minnesota, where the land was flat, 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 flat. You could see the birds whirling and swirling above in the skies high above, but you could never imagine what they could see looking down. Time went on and my grandmother went to church. She went to socials, we'd call them parties. She got interested in a handsome young man, a farmer down the road, and she thought he might be somebody special. But before she got to that stage, she thought to herself, I want to do something special. I want to have an adventure. So she persuaded her next sister, Melissa, and she said to her, you know, it's 1893, and everyone is talking of that exposition in Chicago, the World's Columbian Fair. You know, Hamlin Garland, he said, if you have to, sell the family kitchen stove. Just do what you have to, but get to Chicago and see the exposition. It'd be very educational, Mary said to Melissa, and Melissa smiled because they believed in being educational, and it would be an adventure. And so together they took the train to Fond du Lac. They picked up two young lady cousins, and they all came along and entered finally at Union Station in Chicago. When they got there, Mary and Melissa looked at each other with amazement. Just there, just in Union Station's halls, there were more people than they'd ever seen in one place together. More people probably than there were in Winnebago City. That first night, they were tired, but they thought to themselves, well, to begin our adventure, the least we can do is go down and look at the fair. And so down they went, and oh, as they got closer and closer, it was like a fairy world. They could see in front of them small little lights glimmering on the tops of all the buildings inside the fairgrounds. All they'd ever seen light come from before was candles and maybe kerosene lamps, and here was the fair. Ah, they said to each other, this is indeed the adventure of a lifetime. The next day, they bought a ticket that took them on the little train that went all through the fairgrounds. They saw all the things there were to see and picked which ones they'd go to. They saw the Hall of Agriculture, of course, and looked at the machines that would make their father and brother's lives so much easier. They went to the Hall of Electricity and saw all those marvelous things. And of course, they went to the Hall of Women. And they looked at the pictures and the paintings at Mary Cassette's beautiful mural of women plucking the fruit of knowledge. And they thought to themselves, well, there isn't a man in the world who could have done better than that. And finally, as their time came to a close, the young lady cousins and Melissa said, now Mary, we can't leave the fair without going to the Midway and seeing all those sights. And of course, the young lady cousin said, riding the Ferris wheel. Now my grandmother wasn't so sure about that. She was this tiny little woman and she wasn't sure she wanted to go up on that Ferris wheel. But nonetheless, they went to the Midway. They went to Hagenbach's wild animal circus and they saw magnificent lions and tigers and bears and thought, oh my, they're really different from what they look like in pictures. But at the end, they kept insisting it was time to go to the Ferris wheel. Now my grandmother, she wasn't at all eager to go, but her cousins and her sister said, now Mary, if you go on the Ferris wheel, we'll buy you a souvenir, anything you like. Anything I like, said my grandmother. Yes, they said. And so she was convinced. She paid her 50 cents. They got in line, and as the line got closer and closer to the Ferris wheel, my grandmother got more and more nervous. There it was, 260 feet high. She'd never seen anything so high. 36 cars, each of them 
the size of a school bus, able to hold 30 or 40 people. And oh no, as she got closer, she could see that that wheel never stopped turning. You had to step on and step off while it was still moving. She wanted to turn and leave, but she said to herself, no, I'm going to stay. They can make me get on, but they can't make me look. And so as she stepped onto the Ferris wheel, she ran quickly to one of those revolving seats in the middle. She closed her hands over her eyes, and she said to herself again and again, they can make me get on, but they can't make me look. Oh, she gave a little cry as she felt the lurch as the Ferris wheel started to move up. She scrunched her eyes more tightly, but her cousin and her sisters were paying no attention to her. They were too busy exclaiming. And as she listened to them, she finally opened her fingers just a bit. <gasps> what she saw made her drop her hands and run to the windows herself. It was magnificent. It was unlike anything she'd ever seen. There were the people all down below her. There were, like ants, as tiny as she was, there was the sea going on forever. Oh, she cried out. Oh, I can see what the birds can see. And indeed she had. And she came on down. I think she probably wanted to go on again. I don't know for sure. But I do know that she claimed her prize. She went over to a souvenir case with Melissa and the cousins and she looked in and saw all kinds of wonders. She saw lace handkerchiefs and painted cups and glasses and she thought to herself, no, no. And there, back in the case, she saw the tiniest of little spoons with a rose on its handle and Chicago written in beautiful fancy letters in the bowl. It reminded her of how tiny she was and of how very tiny people had looked from the top of the Ferris wheel. That's what I'll have, she said, and that's what she took. She went back to Minnesota, and indeed this was the adventure of her lifetime. She never did have a chance to go anywhere else, because you see, she married that handsome young man, and with him, she had 10 children. The youngest was my father. And when my father was only 18 months old, my grandfather died, and there was Mary Perez O'Hines, left with all those children in the farm. She took care of them, she loved them, and she never forgot how she had gone to Chicago. If any of them was feeling sick, she'd make them a cup of bark tea, and she'd bring out the honey in the Chicago spoon, and she'd let them stir honey into their tea, and she'd tell them, oh child, before you were born, I went to Chicago to the great Columbian Exposition of 1893, and oh, the things I saw. And she'd tell them all. Hagenbach's Wild Animal Circus, La Rubita Hospital, all those wonders, but she'd always end the same. But child, the last day, the last day, I went up in that Ferris wheel, way into the sky. I looked down, and oh, I could see what the birds can see. There's very little left to my story. My grandmother grew old. She had Alzheimer's. She couldn't remember who we were. I was well, one of the youngest of her grandchildren, but she never forgot how she'd gone to the Chicago World's Fair, and she never forgot going up on the Ferris wheel. She died, having been taken care of for a long time by her daughter Gladys, my auntie Glad, who had no children but had a heart of gold. And when Annie Glad died, all of us cousins, there were 40 of us or more, came to the funeral to celebrate her. And we went one last time to the house where she had taken care of Grandma. And we looked and said to each other, we'll each take one thing, one thing to remember these wonderful women by. And so I looked, I looked at the hand-painted china, I looked at the glass globes, I looked at all these things that there could be. And then on the sideboard, I saw the tiniest of spoons with a rose on the handle in Chicago written in the bowl. It was the Chicago spoon, and I thought to myself, this is what I'll take, and I did. And that's the story of my grandmother and the Chicago spoon.